Thank you, George. I'm excited to uh, actually, you know, here I am <coughs> listening to uh, the likes of Dr. Brownwald and Dr. Fooster talking about uh, CT and coronary calcium when I can remember uh, giving speeches when there were three people in the room, Rob Schwartz, myself, and some drunk who got lost uh, stumbling into the wrong ACC AHA session. So uh, we've come a long way, and uh, let's try to talk about this. I'm going to try and blend uh, uh, a lot of this stuff is philosophy. That's what we do, and this is really my current philosophy on the situation. We really can't exploit the proper way to define individuals without having a proper method of separating people from high and low risk. If we misclassify people, then many higher risk people would not be identified, denying them what we now consider to be considerably advantageous therapy. And conversely, many lower risk individuals are subject to overtreatment with a variety of medications that still have, as far as I'm concerned, some long-term consequences regarding safety. Coronary heart disease in a given person is a complicated thing, and it's due to a variety of factors which we all know that are related largely to genetics and metabolism, uh, modified by your habits, modified by your lifestyle, and modified by your environment, as well as your individual susceptibility to inflammation. How good is uh, current NCEP designation for traditional things. We've heard Dr. Brownwald talk about that. We've heard Dr. Fooster and even Dr. Zipes indicate that it's very difficult to do that. Here's a very interesting study that was published last year uh, and looked at 222 patients who had their first myocardial infarction. And the real question was, if I had seen them in the office yesterday, how would I have felt about them? Today they have a myocardial infarction. And these are people that on the red that would have qualified for therapy and the people in uh, yellow that would not have qualified for therapy. That is, they would have been at considered goal. High-risk individuals, Dr. Bronwell has explained that to you, we consider by the NCEP criteria that if you're above 2% per year or 20% per decade, we call you high risk. Well, if you look at these people, then they should be considered to have an NCEP LDL goal less than 100, probably less than that clinically, but that's been the guideline. 6% would not have qualified for that. That is, they already had an LDL less than 100, and 6% would have qualified for a whopping 12% of these individuals. People that were considered to be intermediate risk, again, I'm seeing them the day before their infarction in the office, and I'm trying to characterize them. Their goal would have been less than 130 for an LDL. 8% would not have qualified. They would have already been below that. And 10% would have qualified for therapy for an initial 18% of individuals. What about the people that I see in the office and I say, you know what, you look terrific. Your risk is low. You're absolutely just doing great. And I want to get your LDL down, but the NCEP tells me that if it's Below 160, I guess we're doing pretty well. 61% would not have qualified, 9% would have qualified, and 70% of the total people that had the MI yesterday that I saw in the office, I would have totally blown it. So 88% of these relatively young people who suffered their first infarction were in the low to intermediate risk category, according to Framingham Risk, and would have been missed as truly being high risk as modified by the fact that they came in the next day with a heart attack. So let's put up the uh, vulnerable plaque uh, pyramid, or triangle as you wish, and look at these individual situations. We have the low-risk population that we define, and then they are modified by individuals that have a family history, intermediate risk, subclinical atherosclerosis fits in here, and then true cardiovascular disease. We certainly can see the modulation that as we increase and we find people that are low risk but fall into the positive family history, we increase them a little bit up into intermediate risk. Some intermediate risk people, as we've talked about, are appropriate for further imaging and should be looked at for subclinical atherosclerosis. After we find or don't find subclinical atherosclerosis, we can recategorize them. Many of them are categorized up to truly having cardiovascular disease. 
People talk about risk. This is from Leslie Shaw's paper. Is Leslie here? That <laughs> Leslie just walked in. Thank you. All right. Anyway, this is a large study uh, looking at 10,377 individuals from Nashville, Tennessee, with Dr. Callister, and uh, looking at them down the road. And what they did is they looked at the National Death Registry. How do I know you're dead? I look at your Social Security number, and if it's retired, then I guess you're dead, unless you're living in the south of France. So they found, again, that diabetes, smoking, and hypertension all produce the kinds of risks that we do. So when a patient comes into our office and we say, listen, you, you're a smoker, you have twice to three times the risk of the guy who doesn't smoke. Same kind of thing. They also found that when you looked at the coronary calcium scores, you could also characterize them using this sort of characterization where you see an incremental increase in the relative risk. Furthermore, they found it to be incremental and independent of the conventional risk factors. Let me describe to you a very, very, very brief case of two individuals. There are two prominent men. You will know them when I show you their pictures. Both were smokers. Number one stopped, number two continued to smoke. Both with limited exercise, number one became an avid runner, lost weight, became very fit. Number two continued to be inactive and obese. Both number one and number two had a family history of premature death. So who's at greater risk to have a myocardial infarction? This little guy over here, Jim Fix, died at 53 of a heart attack, had a terrible family history, probably had unstable angina the day he died, but regardless of that, he thought he could cure himself by exercise. This gentleman over here just did whatever the hell he wanted, had a great time, and lived to be 91. Now his father died prematurely. I'm not telling stories out of school. Unfortunately, his father died of tertiary syphilis. But just the same, uh, they had premature disease in their family. If you look at how you might use electron beam CT, this is from our uh, Ohio database, 8,500 middle-aged patients referred for testing. And you look at family history, no family history, parental, sibling, or both. That's premature disease before the age of 55, men or women. Just made a judgment call on that one. You look for men and women. You'll find that when you have the presence of disease, especially in both, there's a 1.4 1 increase in men when the calcium score is just positive. And for advanced disease, above the 75th percentile, it's 2 to 1. It's even worse in women, 2 to 1 and 2.2 two to 1. That is that the family history, just by itself, virtually doubles the risk. And it needs to be considered in that situation. You also can use electron beam CT. This is a composite of nine studies. There are other studies out. This doesn't include the latest one from Dr. Raji and Dr. Budoff that looks at this. This is more of a concept. Don't take home the numbers. The numbers don't mean anything. It's a concept that if we are looking at disease getting worse over time, we find that in general, individuals who have subclinical atherosclerosis as defined by electron beam CT have on average a 20 to 50 percent increase per year in their calcium score or their calcium burden. Individuals that were treated largely with statins were found to have on average about a 5 to 20 percent per year. Certainly didn't stop it, but again if our goals are to slow down the progression of disease, it looks like that we have at least one test that can potentially be helpful in looking at that as a goal for determining response to therapy. This is borrowed from Dr. Raji's paper. It's looking at a great uh, individual, in, uh, group of individuals again that demonstrated looking at percentile ranking. When you look at percentile ranking, that's how you compare with the other kids your age. And when you see here that as you go up higher and higher in your ranking, Remember, you don't want to be in the high ranking like every other thing. This is like golf scores. You want to be low. You don't want to be high. You can look at individuals and notice that the annual event risk goes up considerably. In fact, these are very reminiscent of what Dr. Brownwald's divisions of low-risk individuals that fall below individuals such as below the 25th percentile. 
intermediate risk between 25th and 75th percentile, high risk between 70th and 90th, and very high risk defined here about 6.5 to 7% per year into very high risk categories. What I'm trying to emphasize is that you need to understand the combination of taking conventional factors and adding in the subclinical imaging to try to make clinical sense of what you're doing. You cannot practice in a vacuum. You need to understand this. This is but what we have been preaching for years. This is, in fact, looking at percentile ranking and adjustments to chronological age. Age is the most powerful predictor in the Framingham risk equations. You can have a cholesterol of 450, but if you're 20 years old, the chances of you having a heart attack in the next decade are very remote. If you had the same thing when you're 60 years old, the chances are very high because of age. Less than 25th percentile, subtract 10 years, no adjustment for being the average guy, the average man or woman, and if you're above that to the 90th percentile, add 10 years. And in fact, this is totally accredited to Dr. Scott Grundy, who suggested this back in the paper uh, published several years ago and really got most of us thinking about how we can apply this to understand Framingham risk. Uh, just like everything else, I tend to push to the next level, and I felt that wasn't aggressive enough and if you're above the 90th percentile, I actually make you 20 years older. Let's talk about how we apply these things. We talk about conventional low to intermediate risk individuals between the ages of 35 and 65. I've given you a male who has a total cholesterol of 210, HDL borderline acceptable, no diabetes, no smoking, systolic blood pressure mildly elevated. When you look at the Framingham risk, we divide people into low risk, intermediate risk and high risk categories. Now if you are to take the Framingham risk here in red and you look at the same numbers but you plug in just a different age, you get this curve. This individual at 35 would have been low risk and by the time he becomes about 55 he would fall into intermediate risk. If you talk about defining calcium score throughout that whole category and let's say that they fell below the 25th percentile then they would remain low risk throughout all of these years where if they had had a calcium score above the 75th percentile they would have been an intermediate risk even as young individuals and classified much earlier as high risk and then once you get above the 90th percentile they're high risk no matter what age they fall into. Let's look at intermediate to high risk, the same kind of situation, male, high cholesterol, low HDL, no diabetes, no smoking, and a lot higher systolic blood pressure. Same characterization, if you look at him as a Framingham risk from age 35 to 65, he would have transitioned from low to intermediate to high risk with exactly the same numbers other than the fact that he's getting older. If he had a calcium score less than the 25th percentile throughout his age, throughout these ages, he would remain low risk until he got on the age of 60 where he'd be intermediate. And when he's higher than that, he would be high risk both in these categories along the way. If you look at these characterizations and you try, try to figure out how you can incorporate these situations, you'll realize that intermediate conventional risk patients and high risk conventional risk patients frequently are miscalcified, misclassified, not calcified. Excuse me, a little... Okay, all right, whatever. One-third or more are actually low risk. One-third or more are actually high risk. And in the high conventional risk, you can also misclassify people. So again, we go back to what Dr. Zipes had actually said. About two-thirds of the people we actually misclassify. They could be higher, they could be lower. We get it right about 33% of the time. So let's go back to the concept then. The incidence of coronary disease goes up with age. We agree with that. It makes perfectly good sense. We got tons and tons of data. But about that curve, there are highs and lows. And in fact, there are areas of insecurity in terms of calculating these situations. Where I think electron B coronary calcium score comes in, in defining incremental value is within a specific age groups. Now in the simplest analysis, incremental value is merely post-test likelihood over pre-test likelihood. Now it could be a positive or negative number, but if you just 
give the absolute value that it always goes up or it always goes some way. And if you look at that, my interpretation is that electron beam CT has a value within these categories because the dominance of age takes over. So if you're a 70 year old, personally, I think it probably doesn't add much incremental value to traditional factors. But within these huge loops here of insecurity, I think you can see the incremental value coming in. So risk increases as the calcium score and the percentile rank. And again, this is this point that we've stressed over for the years. It can identify the vulnerable plaque, but it can help you identify the vulnerable patient, which is what we're talking about today. So at present, we've established the following. Coronary calcium is atherosclerosis. The magnitude of the score relates to the severity of the atherosclerotic disease. The calcium score, as well as the percentile rank, provide information in which to view risk factors rather than the other way around. The data on examining progression, although I didn't present that fully, are consistent with the potential to use that as the modifier of how well we're doing. It could be our report card for the individual. So the calcium score, again, extent of disease in a given person related to a consequence of a variety of factors, some of which we can measure and many of which we cannot measure, we can't put on a scale, we can't measure in a blood test. So it might make more sense to use this as the additional risk factor or the risk measurer, incorporate that again with conventional assessments. So when you're talking about again the combination of the low risk and these situations, I've now changed this to atherosclerosis imaging, which is really where I think we should be going. And in fact, you see an increase. So EBT and other forms of atherosclerosis imaging, not just electron beam CT, take population statistics and they put them into a personal statistics situation. This is what you have as a person, not what a hundred people have that look and smell the same as you. So by measuring this, it allows you to give the extent of what I call pre-symptomatic coronary heart disease. Thank you. <laughs>